I think we're just going to get started. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. So, uh, Steve Peterson really doesn't need an introduction. This is for my, just to keep my own feeble memory from uh, wandering too far in, 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 in various areas. But certainly, uh, uh, as, as Steve Peterson and Barbara Littenberg are widely known for their contributions to uh, the idea of the city, to urbanism, uh, their practice has uh, had far-reaching effect on, on, on many other uh, people as, as they're wonderful teachers, both at universities and uh, as, as practitioners. Um, <coughs> uh, the influence of Colin Rowe has been significant on both Barbara and Steve. Uh, of course, they were his students, and uh, through Colin, uh, and they, they, they engaged those ideas of what it is to be alive in a world which, in the post-industrial world, and, uh, and how you make uh, uh, sense out of the, the madness that's been generated, and uh, looking at the great cities of the world and how those, and particularly Rome, about how, why that is so important for us today. Um, <coughs> the, uh, Steve was, of course, a, a, a student at, at Cornell, uh, where Colin taught, uh, both his undergraduate and graduate work. And uh, he, the, uh, he has taught at many, many schools of architecture, including, and I will, it's a long list, but Princeton, University of Pennsylvania. I think you need to know this. So, <laughs> all right? so, because you need to know why you know, it's, the, the magnitude of, of, of the influence that these two people have had. Uh, so Pennsylvania, Princeton, Yale, Cornell, Harvard, Columbia, Syracuse, Notre Dame, and visiting a uh, Kai professor at the University of Maryland including lecturing widely across the country and across the globe. So uh, I also might add that he, uh, Steve was executive director of the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, which is a very important organization uh, in, the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, really sort of transforming notions of architecture <coughs> and, uh, and, and, and reinforcing the importance of urbanism, the idea of cities and uh, uh, towns and uh, and, and such. There are three things that I particularly remember about uh, Steve and Barbara. I mean, I'm a while, but, uh, when I was a student at Cornell, uh, I remember seeing Progressive Architecture's <coughs> cover, which was uh, a master plan for Cornell. And I remember looking at it, of course, when you're a student, when you see the master plan, you're, you're, you're putting yourself into it. But it was just the, the beauty of it, that you could actually visualize yourself going through these spatial sequences of object buildings that were creating space. It was really a kind of a revelation of what it meant, what urbanism meant. Because it didn't just mean uh, being in a big city, uh, but it meant even on a campus uh, uh, like Cornell's, which is not unlike ours, uh, what, ur what, the, what the meaning of urbanism meant. The other piece that I, I remember with great fondness was uh, uh, the con their entry into the competition for Le Havre, the uh, this uh, district of the markets in Paris that was blown apart and this really wretched uh, <coughs> piece was inserted in in the 70s. And again, the same thing about these rich spatial sequences leading to, play to, 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 uh, to destinations and marking them with architecture. Again, uh, a very didactic project for uh, students uh, in, in my class and uh, 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 throughout the school. And finally, we fast forward to uh, post uh, September 11th uh, in the uh, uh, Winter Garden uh, down by Battery Park City, where the exhibition were for the World Trade Center uh, uh, projects was being held. I managed to make the last day of the exhibition. And I wandered through, and of course, there were the, the entries by uh, Rafael Vignoli, uh, 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 Peter Eisenman and, and company, and the usual group of suspects. And uh, of course, they're in the midst of this, uh, what uh, uh, Andres showed as uh, being Star Wars bar, uh, was uh, uh, Steve and Barbara's uh, proposal. And it was, what, what, what struck me was that it wasn't something for your dining table. Mm -hmm. Oop. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what, what I started to walk through and instead of looking at the projects, listening to what people were talking about. And virtually every project 
you listen to this lay audience, this were mostly you know, people from New York City and surrounding areas, you know, doesn't that, that oh, I, I just got to get that for so-and-so's desk. Mm -hmm. And it was really, I mean, the, the, the impact of that architecture is no longer about the spatial experience, but about just being an object and something that is de a decorative element at that was completely lost. Stephen Barber's scheme was all, can really only be appreciated as a pedestrian and as a citizen walking through, again, a spatial sequence that has articulation of space, that, that, that uh, there's this tension between the object and the void, and their, their, their brilliance of being able to convey this throughout their career and demonstrated as teachers, especially when they won the Athena Award from CMU this year, was really just, uh, uh, it's always breathtaking to listen to. So, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to make this debate work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, please join me welcoming back to Notre Dame. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And, uh, can you hear me if I just speak like that in the back? Yes. Yeah? Okay. I may be going back and forth. Uh, it's good to be back at Notre Dame again. As Michael said, we had a couple of years of really enjoyable time in Rome. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to show five of our projects eventually in this talk. They're all urban design projects. The whole talk is about urban design, not specifically architecture. And it's about urban design in dense, uh, big cities like New York, Paris, Rome, not towns like South Bend, which is not a city, you know, it isn't really. Uh, it's certainly not urban, it might be a city by the population, but it's not urban. And I, I, I came to the realization that this difference between what's actually urban in a big agglomeration of people is significant and important to define. And uh, I gave a talk about this and showed our work in my, uh, in my no, it was, uh, West Palm Beach, where the CNU conference was, as Michael mentioned. And then I went to China. Now, you, some of you may have been with, to China, but I went with my son and daughter-in-law, who herself is Chinese, and her two, sis, two aunts live in Nanjing. So I got a chance to actually see China at an intimate level. We went from Shanghai to Nanjing to the Yellow Mountains, uh, and finally ended up in Beijing, which I'm sure you all recognize this is. And this is the forbidden city here. Uh, and it was the one city that in aerial photos by Google, I thought, well, I'm going to recognize this. This is going to be, it's a grid. It's just a grid, pretty simple, big boulevards like 3rd Avenue and 2nd Avenue and stuff, big blocks that are easy to plan in and do things in, until I realized how big it was. Hmm. There was something strange about it. Uh, I don't know how to do this in the proper sequence because it's, we stayed in a hotel right here. And we got there in the evening and said, let's just walk over to the <laughs> Forbidden City. It only take a few minutes. No, it took 35 minutes to walk there, if not more. Because just this little block, which looks like it might be New York City, this, this little block is 1,000 feet long and 2,300 feet in this direction with no penetrations whatsoever. So some of these other ones, let me go on to the next one. I, I haven't got this part of the lecture that well organized because I just got back. Some of the other ones are even crazier. Now this is a, this is a plan of Beijing in 1530. So this is Baroque period in Europe. Now when was the uh, sack of Rome? 27. 27, okay, so it's darn near, you know what, almost everything has sort of happened at that point. And this is the same thing. So you get the Forbidden City and this fake mountain that they built at the back, the Forbidden City and this fake mountain built at the back. And all that gridding was there at that time. And this was, there are three cities. There's the Forbidden City, there's the inner city, which had a wall around it, and then the city itself and some development, suburban development outside. The limited number of gateways and the way the city worked out was, was gridded and orthogonal because of the uh, Chinese belief in nature and agriculture and man's harmonious connection with the natural world, which comes from Confucius. There's no state religion there. There's no, although there's Buddhism and Taoism, there's no actually how to live together 
is their primary religion for, through Confucius up until the um, communist revolution, which, in which Confucius was thrown out. And in some ways, it's understandable because Confucius kept everything the same for a long time. He, he was dead. Of course, he lived in about 800 AD. But anyway, oh, shit. If you look at the grid up from 1550, 30, you see that these big streets, these big blocks are there. So look at the size of that one. If that one is 2,300 feet long, what, what is that one? <laughs> and some of these, you see little interstitial, in, interstices of streets going through, but almost none of them go through in a systematic way, and almost none of them run north-south. It's actually very strange. So these vast areas in the imperial cities were actually walled. Each one of them was walled in. They were like towns within towns. And the entrances to any one of these blocked in areas consisted of like one, two, three places. And those gates were locked at whatever time, 10 o'clock or something like that. So that the citizens in there, who were all either bureaucrats or military people, all serving the emperor, had to go home, go to bed, eat, do what they had to do. They couldn't get out till the morning. So there was an amazing, intense control over the population. And what appears to be one of the great gridded urban plans like Miletus or well, in our Western history is actually a very different thing. Um, I forget which one of these blocks I actually measured again. One of them is, uh, let me get this because it's kind of important. Um, the, big, the big block over here, just, just on this part of the map, this one, is 2,300 feet across the top there and 3,000 feet long this way. So this was a, a whole town. I mean, that's an enormous number of New York City blocks, obviously. Uh, and what the other consequence of this plan organized around a center is that it isn't really gridded. Each one of these roads stops. It can't go through from side to side. It's a little bit like Central Park in New York. It, except, except it doesn't have the underground passageways through it like Central Park in New York does. So this, this cannot go through because of that. This cannot go through because of the city. This one didn't go through originally, what was blasted through later because the gate to the city was up here. And then every, everything was, because it was all aimed at the emperor, it's incomplete as a, as a gridded network like we would expect to find in the American city. And I find this interesting because it reveals something about the grid as we know it. Uh, and my conclusion is that, and this is a bit of an exaggeration because I don't, haven't had the scholarship to find this and look into it, but I don't think China ever had urbanism. They had big cities. They were always big cities, but they weren't urban. Because in, in, within each one of these little pieces here is a very small, it's made up entirely, and this is a model of present day uh, Beijing. This is actually a little street inside one of these interior streetways that's really just an alley. This one happens to be in Shanghai, so that's a little bit of a, I didn't take pictures that carefully. So this is in Shanghai, and this is, the, this is what Every house inside those vast areas was a courtyard house. And then actually what's missing from this is the wall that went around it because you'd come in a gate, walk across the courtyard, come in the main house and then go back to the next one. And the, the first, this is all facing south down below. And so the family lived in, the head of the family and the elderly lived here, kids lived here, servants lived here, a nephew lived here, cousins lived there was all made in this way. And every single house built in China for almost 2,000 years was built the same way, in the sense that they were courtyards, one or two stories high. They all treated the buildings as objects stuck in there together. There's no corners in it. There's nothing like the courtyards in Italy in this at all that makes the colonnade. They're, they're, they're an assembly of objects push intensely together, and then right next to it is another one and another one, and you get hundreds of them in there. And within them, there's no place, there's no public space that's kind of dramatic 
as a marketplace or anything. It's this highly rational organized system, which I don't think makes an urban condition. And it made me realize that what I had assumed all my life, all my career, that I was doing urban design, that I was making cities, I was making part of cities. I grew up in Chicago. I now live in New York. That we assumed that cities were all like this, like we knew them. They have actually had this fabric of interactive connectedness in this public way everywhere, but not, not really in China historically. So when it came to the communist revolution and then the post-communist expansion into a semi-free capitalist market under Deng Xiaoping, they didn't know what to do. There was no history of it except for the European influences that came in on the Bund in Shanghai and a few blocks back. The rest of it rested on this, this fundamental, which is still there. They're actually beginning to preserve it, which is probably good. So that was that repetitious system. And what they started to do in, in the 30s before uh, Mao, but mostly afterwards, was to build slabs, this sort of Russian organization of slabs, although these are fairly new. They're still, this landscaping is still being built. These buildings are probably no more than about five years old. And what you can see, this is familiar to us. We think of public housing projects in New York like that, or in Chicago. They're denigrated terribly as being unlivable places, uh, kept away from the city in environments that are isolated on the ground. But everywhere in China, this is in, uh, oh, I forget, Hangzhou, Shou, Hangzhou, Hangzhou, um, outside my hotel window. <laughs> uh, and this is Nanjing. But these, these were all made in a way on the principle, they were accepted there because of this principle of repetitive courtyard buildings, I think. And the idea of a public world there of urban context of urban space just didn't exist. It was not something that was missed. Uh, then just to give you an example, of, this is uh, the main intersection of the main two streets in Nanjing. And there's one, I mean, you don't see them, two, three multi-story shopping centers on the same street. Four, five, six story shopping centers, shopping malls like the ones in Chicago that go up three or four floors on the northwest side of Michigan Avenue. And they're all that close to each other. And underneath this intersection, it is so busy that pedestrians are not allowed technically to cross through it. There's barriers along the edge here. In order to get from this side to this side, you go down underground, over here, and come back up. People do cross it. There are some pedestrians in there. But they have to leap across hedges and curbs, get out in the street, and then fight with the cars, which are all in one lane. There's eight lanes of cars two lanes of bicycles and motorcycles, and then a sidewalk inside that. And underneath this entire thing, this is where the incredible exuberance and dynamism of Chinese culture comes into it. Underneath this entire thing is another mall. <laughs> so you go down in this thing to get to the other side, and suddenly you're walking around shops like you're completely disoriented and lost. But it's amazing, because there's Gucci down there, and whatever the fancy bags are, you know. Uh, something Gabbana, it's all there <laughs> underneath this intersection. And the best restaurants, now this is in Nanjing where my daughter-in-law's uh, aunts live. They took us out to dinner. I, I ate, ate more Chinese food in the 20 days I was there than I have ever in my life <laughs> uh, on big rotating things. Uh, the best restaurants in Nanjing are in one of, not, not, oops, uh, blah, 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 blah. not in this shopping center here, but in this one here on the third floor, you go up there evening time and there's lines waiting to get into this restaurant because it so, has such a good reputation in China. So everything about street life, even though it looks like there's a street here, these are not streets. And these are about the same width as those big pieces of grid in the original Beijing, which were described in a book that I was reading as nine chariots wide, hmm. going together fast down the road. Uh, so we kind of know what the purpose of it is. All right. New China, or this is New Beijing. Old Beijing is up here somewhere, and this is the route that comes out to the east. And this, of course, is Ram Gulhas's CCT building. And just incidentally, because I thought it was fun, this is a Tony Smith sculpture. <laughs> 
that I know Rem knows well because Tony Smith had an exhibition at Cornell for two years when Rem was just coming there. Not, not that he wouldn't know from other sources, but it is clearly a work of sculpture and a work of art, not a work of architecture. The dimensions of that site, for instance, um, are along this mm, to here, from here to here, which is his site, 1,300 feet by 1,700 feet. And all of this is actually the CCTV. There's a hotel here and all this kind of stuff, too. So what's happening is that the, I think the Chinese fixation on the object building, objects, objects, even in a courtyard, you get objects. You don't make the space of the courtyard. Shows up as a natural proclivity here. Why not have this, this happen on the perimeter? Then there's objects with gates into the wall and objects with courtyards. Even they're making them. This is the new town hall in Nanjing. This is in Beijing. <coughs> and then this is the railroad station in Nanjing built in the Russian period. So what do you find here? A giant gate through a wall a major space inside, which is courtyard-like, and this building, which is actually quite wonderful, I think. <laughs> uh, and then here's another one in Beijing, and this is another one outside of uh, Shanghai. They're inventive, incredible architecture, assembled on non-organized kind of forms, and they come in clusters. You go on the train or on a bus from one city to the other, and you'll go along for about 10 minutes, all of a sudden there'll be a cluster of about 12 tall buildings. Okay. So that's, that's un, it has an effect on done my faith that, that, or my assumption that urbanism uh, and cities are the same and that uh, urbanism as we know it in the West is not just a spontaneous evolution of time making things denser and denser, streets and squares appearing by naturally clearing sites out and make them happen. It's actually an invention. It's an in, urbanism, as we know it, is an innovation, conscious, deliberate innovation, because it didn't happen in another place in the world where there are equal number of people, if not more. Um, so, let me let me. Now I start what was the old lecture, um, and I have, I'm going to read something that I read before this, just for your information. The other aspect of this is what's city and what's urban, and uh, that they're not the same. And you, forgive me and bear with me about this business of urban because it's it's a, a very complex thing. Uh, people, everybody thinks that urban and city are the same, or that large groups of people assembled together are that's it's urban. It's urban. But I think it's useful to, de to define urban and city separately because it's only when you have urban, physical, formal conditions that you develop the extended capacities of buildings being put together. And I'll show you what that is in a minute. <clears throat> but anyway, this is Shanghai on the right here. And I, this was the plan that uh, Norman, not Norman Foster, Richard Rogers did which made this a complete circle and buildings running around in a park along the edge, which is semi-rational. What actually happened is the park inside the city is, is an odd shape. There are three extremely strange towers going up on this end over here, and you can't get to the park because the traffic on these big roads is so big that you have to go up in the air and across a bridge and down. And when you're up in the air, you can walk from this part of town all the way to this part of town, and at a traffic intersection, there's a big circle in the air that everybody walks around. It comes down at each corner. Instead of it going under, it goes over. This is where the Chinese are actually phenomenal. Uh, this, it turns out, this is the Hudson River. You might have thought this was some Asian development going on. This is 11th Avenue and 10th Avenue. I think I've got them right. And this is the Penn Central Yards. This is the master plan for the Penn Central Yards. It's an incredibly open and undesigned in a certain way. I mean, can you imagine this sort of flowing nature of buildings, these different boxes? I mean, they're pretty tall buildings, so when you take a picture of this, it looks like it's all built up in a way like that. 
uh, but there's no space. And just, I want to point out one thing. What happens in this non-city, and it certainly is a city, it's part of New York City, so it's a city. The way to define what's wrong with it, I think, is to sharpen up the definition of urbanism. Uh, and one of them, so there's no, as you can see, there's no systematic block system. There's no spatial definition that's consistent and elaborate. It's just fluid, what I used to call anti-space. Everything goes to infinity. And imagine getting a cab if you lived in that building. Walk out one night wanting to go to dinner. You'd have to walk all the way down here to this street and finally get a cab. These dead end, they actually designed cul-de-sacs in New York City. I'll come back to this because I'll, I'll show you a way at the end of the talk, I'll show you a way of urbanizing this. Um, so there's lots of city, but little urban. Despite all the work on urban design since the 1970s, when we all rediscovered the city as a third formal typology, typology and I, I'm sorry for reading this, but there's things in it that I want to get across. That is a typology different from architecture and art. The latest worldwide extensions of cities are very disappointing. I think we all agree with this. Most are not urban, just big and dense, without space formed. So there are two thoughts. Because China never made cities into a complex and varied urbanism, one realizes how unique Western urban form is. It doesn't just happen. It is radically different from China's, and other Western urbanism is a deliberate and distinct innovation. I said this before, so. Two, it is important to distinguish city from urban in, in its formal nature. There is a difference between size and form. There are eight definitions of cities, primarily by boundaries and scaling of size of population. One is called city proper. One is municipality. One is urban area, which is usually not urban, often relates to the CBD. Then there's metropol metropolitan. Then there's conurbations. These are all in Wikipedia, by the way, used by planners and officials. So how, do you, how, how can we ever get anywhere with these? Then the last two you've heard about. There's urban agglomerations. And each one of these has a different number category you can add to it so we can talk about them. Then there's megacities and megalopolises. Which one are we going to go to? You know, which, which is real city? No definition. What's curious about all this is it's statistical and economic and political, but it's not formal. And we're architects. So I think what's formal in cities, that is, I would start to design urban as being a formal characteristic of cities. And what I want to do tonight is perform, propose a form-based list of necessary urban ingredients of the dense fabric of Western cities. My intention tonight is not to, be, to make a dogma that you either believe in or not believe in, or an ideology, or a list of style limitations that would put us into modern, classic, whatever, but rather to catalog what we actually observe in the best Western urban places to promote some imperial observations of what we find out there. So to start with this, let me let me go through. First of all, what's urban is, can be occur in a small town. But the ideals of urban and town are different. The town, which is by definition is a utopian derivative, but turns out in our culture to be largely single family houses arranged maybe like this. This is uh, New Haven, Connecticut, which is all single family houses arranged around a big ideal grid. Uh, the, the nature of the ideal is that it's limited. It can't be anything else. It can't be, you can't have an ideal that spreads all over the world, all over the landscape. So a lot of the things that we do in the CNU and in town planning are related to this idea and to the town scale. Freestanding buildings adjacent to each other, connected together in a very beautiful way, marvelous housing, wonderful places to live, but not urban, I think. Uh, this is urban, this is Siena, and the unit of town for us is now single family house. The unit of urban is a built-in object that touches its neighbors and is assembled together. You can't see all four sides of it. It is part of a street wall. 
This is a little plan that I'll show you later of Montreal that we did that is urban in many, many different ways. So the, the components of an urban field, are now remember back to China and look at this piece of Paris. You get a round space, a little square space, parallel roads fairly short a distance from each other, another triangular space that leads in two geometries in different directions, and then a slight slice through those that connects back to those original ones. This is just outside of the Palais Royal. Uh, and so the, the thing here, what's amazing about Western urbanism is that it's a, an interactive urban field. It's just like electromagnetism, which is a scientific idea about how you, can't, you have electricity, you always have magnetism. You have magnetism moving, you're going to get electricity. The two of them operate as a field of, independent, of interdependent forces. The same thing happens in the most sophisticated form of urban design that you can get in Western urbanism. In Paris, you can find voids that are objects, and then str streets and solids which are both objects and background conditions to the space. And this spatial equivalence, which Colin Rowe invented, and not really invented, but discovered and elaborated as fig figure ground, figure being the solids, ground being the space, but in a really good city you can reverse them, and you can imagine all the ground, all the mass, is a ground for the piazza that you make, like in painting, the object that you see, the figure that you see, and it, it's real. It's not uh, an academic philosophical idea. This is a picture of Park Avenue. This is also a picture of Park Avenue. In this view, looking down at what was the Pan Am building and the terminal building there, you see all of the streets to the side, all the buildings to the side, despite their up and down projections, as one solid that supports this tube of space that runs back. And you feel that. You walk down. You don't pay attention to how tall the buildings are. You feel this slice of space running through. When you take your attention and apply it to one of the buildings along the way, you suddenly <coughs> discover that it's an object. It's not part of a uniform field, but it's an object. Space is a positive figure here. Solid is a positive figure here. And you, we just see that. We interact with it. It's not something that we imagine. But if we're urban designers, we've got to be able to figure out how to play with both those things. So, so one component of an interactive field of space and form like electricity and magnetism is a, a complete network. And the importance here is on a network of public space. This network has to be linked. Unlike the one in China, there are little bits of streets and so on that are a smaller scale that run through the bigger streets. So you can actually find your way around to any number of different ways. It has a complexity and an elaboration that's amazing. And then public space itself has to be volumetrically enclosed. It can't just be made up of objects. It has to have architecture wrapping around it. The primary example, most famous example, is Piazza Navona, which those of you who've been to the Rome program know uh, is a void of incredible intensity, partly because it was built as an amphitheater in the first place. The other thing is the blocks have to be mm, assembled in an array. This is the, the opposite of space is the solid. The solids have to be in a block array that, that gives you a sense of rhythm, repetition, texture. You can be, you can be here and acknowledge that that is there and know that it's there if you turn left or right and then you're surprised sometimes. But the texture and fluidity of the block array is very much a part of a city that functions as a network. And this is a, a, a drawing showing that the blocks themselves have to be closed. They combine in their perimeter, despite the upper piece, a combined street wall defining the spaces outside them along with other blocks in this array. and a combined a block surface for the f solid that it seems to be. And these blocks can be extremely difficult, uh, different. As long as they fit in, you see how, I mean, it's kind of amazing. These things are all so different, and yet they, because of the network and the component array, you sense that they're all part of the same world. Imagine having those sitting out in a suburban lot somewhere along a road, 
you'd never know they had any connection. It's the spatial links that make it work. So I'm not being fun talking about this, I like it. So the, the, the block is a key thing, and it, what, one thing you can't do is break a block, uh, because it has to do with this fluid interconnections, this uh, perception that is part of a solid whole. If, and I do show this, this is actually Chicago. This one, this is on Division Street in Chicago. So that doesn't look like a terrifying place to go down into. Uh, I mean, and it is, oh shit. <laughs> Where am I going here? I forgive me. Yeah, I mean, th this occurs essentially, uh, you know, at the end of one of these in Chicago. But that thing is even smaller than that. That's an alley that is down on between Division and Rush Street. And that breaking that in an urban, really dense urban context is a no no. In, th in that sense, part Chicago is all almost all non-urban. I, mean, I live there, so I, I know that it's got streets, and I know there's blocks that are pretty good downtown, et cetera, but it's basically not urban. Uh, and then in a city, when you take things apart and try and make new connections that are just loosely made between blocks, it's one thing to put a street between them and call that a form, but you, you, don't, you don't get anywhere. You get all this open space that's just a, a, a non it destroys the illusion and the reality of that surface. And this is what's for the CNU people, don't jiggle townhouses. We, the university bought, I mean, built those buildings right down the street. Did they? Yeah. The, I mean, the jiggle same thing well. <laughs> uh, This was more, but this is actually interesting because between the town and the city, which I started off to talk about, a town does feel complete in its massing because the trees in the backyards block the view. They, they, unlike this, that you can kind of see through it usually with vacant lots and it's unease that you get at the empty, discontinuous solid. There's something about a small town, American small town, particularly with all the individual lots, you do come down and you can't see inside. You, you really normally in the summer you can't see inside. So it is kind of integral with the texture of trees. And then I just made this drawing because I think if that got too big, if that turned into pieces of Shanghai on the same plan, the trees disappear, and all of a sudden, the spaces in between, all of a sudden you see from this street through those two blocks to the back of that house. And that exposes your underwear. Mm -hmm. in, in China, literally, because people hang their clothes out to dry. And maybe they do in America, too, or they used to. So the urban membrane is a concept that unites the block with the responsibility to the street and the surface of the block. Then there's the component of architecture. We finally get the architecture, which is what we're all studying and all doing all the time. And the responsibility here of architecture is to pre-see, pre pre-imagine, preconceive that your building is in a city space. If we want to make cities, we have to always be conscious of trying to make them. And there are sort of two conditions. One is the uh, idea of a building that touches the other one, which is crucial in both of these instances. That is, architecture has to touch its neighbor, it can't stand free, and everybody wants to make a freestanding building, so this is a very hard, this is a very hard objective to try and follow, but it's what makes cities work. This is embedded in the block. There it is. Embedded in that block is a work of architecture. Then towers, which are very controversial particularly at the CNU, are really for no, no, no building should be over four stories, maybe five now, I don't know. Uh, and I understand this, but architecture of towers is perfectly possible to exist within the base of an urban condition. This is the Flatiron Building in New York, which is both a tower and a piece of a block structure. And if you put adequate, make this the base to that, or make this engaged with the facial st structure of the block, the tower becomes entangled, in a sense, in the block's logic. It's not building the block like this one does, which it clearly has to do, but it's in, it's in a new form up in the air, which is entangled in a way integral with the block, so they can kind of do interesting things together. And I don't think they're, you know, necessarily, now here, I probably should go a little faster, shouldn't I? <laughs> uh, just to show you what, the, what entangled and, I mean, here's two churches, two churches. Both of them conceived urbanistically. One 
is the Church of Our Sacred Lady, both in Piazza Navona, obviously. I don't know whether that's clear. This one sits here and goes through the block. This is actually the back entrance. goes through the block. But there's a church which sits on and defines the nature of the bounding space, embedded. Here's an architecture of towers. This could be maybe 20 stories tall. It's a logic of it still operates. It's an architecture entangled in the block base, which runs through and articulates itself to allow that tower to set back and search for the sky. It's, it's the essence of Sant'Agnese, is the essence of what Colin called uh, contextualism. Maybe that one is too, but contextualism is really about uh, multiplicity of readings on something. And just to show you that we do do this even today, this is Lower Manhattan Plan. That's this block, this building, this block, which is, shows the plans at the lower level and at the upper level, and there's the building still existing there. That's a building which is both a block and a tower and an object in an urban condition of Lower Manhattan that is really phenomenal. We really learned about that when we were doing the uh, World Trade Center. Amazing stuff happening in Lower Manhattan that could happen again if people wanted to do it. Uh, here's a tower entangled, contemporary one, on 57th Street. This is I.M. Pei and whatever hotel it is, Four Seasons Hotel. And then here is an architecture where space is made, an urban situation, space is made in, in Berlin. And they knew this is a reconstruction of an existing space before the war. The Leipziger Platz in Berlin, which is across from the more famous one. And they got, made an urban design set of guidelines, and they literally made the square. This is a scrim up on a bulletin board. So before they could get around to affording the building, they built the space. Really cool because it works as a bulletin board for people to come and do it. That space has existed, and it's embedded in a block system that faces out as well as in. So it's not an object. It's, it's one of the most <coughs> intriguing urban design situations that you can find. And if you look for them, you'll find them everywhere. There's one, one other component which is rare, but has to do with being a, a hidden precinct. If you have a precinct can be sequestered within an urban situation, uh, if, it is, if it is sufficiently dense and it can become an urban component. And the, the two primary examples of this are the original Roman forms in the Valley of Rome. And this is the Palais Royale. There's the round space we saw, the Place de Victoire, and this set of grids that goes around it. Uh, so that's another component, although it doesn't construct the urban texture. It, 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 it occurs and can exist only if that urban texture is strong enough. So here's all the components. One, two, three, four, five. Blocks going one way, space going the other, and the space and the blocks are the same. And then this is the architecture of engagement, and the closed block is the essential atom of urban structure. I, I'm going to show you, I'm going to put these together into a taxonomy of connected parts, a way of thinking about this that unites it into sort of a theory of um, architecture. Where am I supposed to do that? I was going to read you something else. Okay. If you start with a block, first of all, oh, what happened? If you start with the block, this is, this is Lower Manhattan. There's the block I showed you, and there's the other block I showed you. I think that's it. And all, all of these things are related to the Lower Manhattan plan, which exists in reality. It's not my invention. It's just looking at what's there. So this is a spatial network that comes out of that. This is the block array that comes out of that. This is actually, mm, which block is it? Uh, this one. This block here, redrawn, for, is exactly this one. And that leads to the street wall as a membrane that joins the spatial network and the public space to the membrane. And I drew the block itself and the space as the same form, just reversed. So that's the idea, is that you can make spaces that are so intense that they work as well as objects. And then architecture starts from here and contributes back to the block. So you can go either way in this sequence. You need all these components to make urbanism, to make the urban. If it doesn't have them, if it doesn't have a street wall block surface continuum, if it doesn't have a network of streets, if it doesn't have an array of blocks, if the blocks themselves are not closed, 
And if the architecture doesn't respect the principles of this thing, you don't get urbanism. It's a lot of things to remember. Uh, and we're not forgetting, we're not remembering it. In the, in the world development of cities, it's just not happening. So I'll come back to that. I'm going to go rather quickly, I think, through the, um, I spent too much time on the theory because it excites me, particularly having come from China. I'll go through and show you five projects of our work, and I'll do it two or three minutes each. First of all, this is Leal. This is Paris again. So the, the space you saw is kind of like over here. And this was the church left over once they tore the markets down. This is an underground pit that goes into a lower level shopping center where all the subway lines come around. And this is the old Bourse de Exchange, the stock market in effect, facing that way. And look, these two things are pretty much lined up on the line. This street lines up with the side tower of that church. This street lines up with a little piazza to that side, and this doesn't line up with that, but there's another space that left over from the previous world. There's a competition to do this, which Michael mentioned, and I'll show you how we approached it. Most took this big space and filled it with an architectural solution, big long avenues, pompous developments, which you can't avoid if you make a single move. So what we decided is to divide the site, and this is an urban design decision, not an architectural one. We decided to divide the site into subsites. You do one thing here and a different one there, and it's not a unified site treatment, because that's architectural. But it's a unified, engaged urban design treatment. So this first part took the axis to the church, took the other axis to the piazza in front, put a monument in there that helps close that space, avoided the logical axis of that, because it doesn't quite work out with anything, and took off, there's a column on the side of this thing in the back for some reason, took that and connected it over into a new site. Then there was a second set of moves, and there's, these are obviously blocks. They're blocks, there's a spatial network. We didn't know, we were, you know what I was just saying, I didn't know at the time. We were just trying to make the city solve the problem. <laughs> It, it, we, and we learned. In a sense, these are blocks, but they don't quite work because they have no interior space. They're too small. But they would have been okay. Then we added in the major public space, which is here with connected spaces that link to the rest of the site in different ways. That diagonal comes off there, and there's an a athletic running platform underneath that runs through. And this space was an internal sequestered precinct. The one last thing I showed you, the kind of outside, which we discovered really. We could, didn't want to make, this is a hidden, this is essentially in the backyard of the city. So you can go, the only way to get in there is one, two, three, four, on the cardinal points. And the rest of this is a rather blank wall, but it's treated as a garden. Here's a view of the first stage of these blocks. Each one of them, they, they don't really connect directly through here, they kind of sneak through in places. This is a hotel, literally, <laughs> opposite the church. And then this development is separate. Uh, this is the interior elevation of the big public space, which with the little courtyard, this space working onto the head of that church, precisely. You go down into the athletic stuff down here, and there's the running track running through. And the walls of this public space appear to be blank. Unlike, that's, that's the space inside here. Spaces outside are conventionally designed as apartment buildings with wonderful windows and so on. And the reason we did that at the time was because we wanted to make a statement about public space being contained and abstract within the reality of a living city as well. So what happens is that around the edges, these, these apartment buildings are that they have enough windows on this side everywhere except a couple of places where there are big window uh, what are they, light wells, in effect, that look out into the space. But the space itself is not produced by the facades of any architecture. It's not produced by a modern architecture. This was in 1979, so who knew what we were going to be doing? It was before classicism was reinvented. I think it was. Uh, so, and this is a, 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 a diagram of all the solid wall structures that make up the public space of the middle piece. And this is the garden that you find inside where you can walk around. And it's based on, this wall is based on when demolition occurs in Paris, what's often left over is the party wall. 
with a light bulb. So this was going to be about the destruction, symbolically the dest destruction of things in Paris and Layout, because it's what you'd get after the buildings were torn down, if they'd been there before. A little too poetic for everybody, I guess. But we, we, we won first prize for it, so it's okay. What happens then is that here's the site. This, I just wanted to show you what is pretty much typical of the solutions. Where it was clearly an architecture, what happens is architecture starts to want to take over everything, then you get this monumentality that you don't want, and you get no life in it. And this is what actually was built. The chaos. If you say it with a Spanish accent, it's cows. I like cows. Uh, what am I doing? Keep going. Let me, give me a yell if it's getting out of hand. Uh, this is a project in New York City. Um, this is the finished project on the left, and it was done in the 84, 86. And uh, it was on an old urban renewal site. I'll come back to this picture in a minute. It was an old urban renewal site that had destroyed the city on the, on the west side at around 53rd Street. This is Clinton Park, which is a beautiful park, overlooks the river. So this is one block from the river. And they tore this down and just left it a mess. These are existing tenement buildings. There's one big building in here, which is a telephone building. This is the proposal of the zoning envelope that they were going to build right here, tear all these buildings down, and build two big towers here, and leave the backs kind of open-ended. Our clients, who were the neighbors who lived there, said, no, we don't want you to do that. We want low-rise buildings. So we came in and we said, you can have low-rise buildings, but you've got to give the guys the towers. They'll never do that. So we showed a proposal that had mid-rise buildings in the back, but renovated and they added on to these buildings. So that the volume, the square footage here is the same as it is here. Now, it's, it's worth telling briefly that across the street for many blocks is a conservation area that doesn't allow any buildings over eight stories. But that was put into place a long time ago. It's a kind of preservation thing. So this is what happens. We developed those two blocks here. Then in addition to that, we took a, a, a whole urban master plan, developed a public space on the axis of that street, which is actually right in there, and connected through all of these. This is actually an urban, uh, urban renewal site over in here, and made another plan. So there's the park, and there's the existing kitchen. Oh, there was a rail, the main rail line comes in underneath the site like that, and goes to Penn Station, which was at that time on our site an open cut. First thing we did is build blocks. <laughs> we didn't know it at the time, but we were building blocks that had a public space in the back. Then we added to it this public square. That was the time that this part of New York was a semi-industrial site. People had warehouses, auto repair shops. It was a kind of arts district. The idea was that this square, I'll show you in a minute, would serve two functions. And then finally, out of that square, over into the public housing portion, and two more blocks like these were to be built on the street. Now, much of this was built by other architects later on, not this. But these two blocks were built, and I'll show them to you in a minute. It's strange to be involved in something like that, and then you're only an urban designer, so what, how much control you have is sometimes disappointing. So this is the pattern of public space that comes in, goes to that, runs through. So there's a, a new set of blocks that's made in here. The public space itself is uh, like Soho. It's got truck docks during the day and overhangs to kind of protect them. And the people can use these for industrial uses up to the third, fourth floor. There's housing up on the top in, with courtyards out the back. And at the end of it, is a theater, an outdoor theater. So at night when the trucks all go away, which they're required to do, you can turn it into a public theater. We thought that was good. Uh, this shows you the blocks I will, that were made in a, in a semi-array. It's hard to squeeze them in and make a consistent piece out of it. Then this is the block we made, which is, uh, whoop, 
Yeah, which is these, this is the, this is actually the back that faces the new public space in the back. This is the street out on 10th Avenue with the old tenements remodeled and the new buildings in back. And inside, inside between them is a common courtyard. They don't show a picture of. This is what they built. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but they did save the lower buildings and, and essentially add on to them so that the block system from across the street in the preservation area slips across the street and these guys stand up behind it. Problem is, of course, is they didn't complete the block. You see that gap there? They didn't complete the block, they broke the block. Uh, there was a lower Manhattan plan that we did uh, prior to the World Trade Center site. I'll briefly show you, that's the World Trade Center. When we did this plan that opened up a space in here and developed a space in here, remodeled Battery Park and proposed a new railway station down here which we had coming through underground. Uh, that was paid for by, and this is the existing conditions prior to the plan. And these are the two or three primary spaces. We proposed modifications to the lower part of Battery Park City, a square that would come out and reroute this tunnel traffic, which is the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, the central square in the, this district, which comes right out of Battery Park City to the north, and that church that would slip in over here. Because the World Trade Center, very much like the Forbidden City, broke off, you can't get through here. There's no connections. It broke off five different street connections to the surrounding area. So <coughs> as horrible as it was ah, that it happened, uh, there was an opportunity to remake something else. Uh, and then we, we actually made a plan for, for the uh, new park and aligned the finish of Battery Park with the new developments on this side, et cetera. Then we come to the World Trade Center Innovation Design Study. Uh, it's actually a five-acre memorial garden. We came up with a solution to the, to the, uh, the memorial is to make it a void, not make it an object, and not tear down the rest of the world and leave a big L-shaped site, the primary thing in, oh, where, oh, I can't get this right. I'll go faster, let me, let me show you this. Here's the way it was before, with all those streets. Then it fell down and left this big hole, not just in itself, but look at how it affects the fabric around it. The big emptiness is something like, what do you do next? God, we can do good things in many ways there. And that was our proposal. The plan connects every one of these back into a network and actually takes these two streets and runs them together symbolically into this place. This street runs symbolically into that place. No cars go through here. Uh, but this street connects up and over and over and around and each of these connect down through a block system. So surrounding them are more, this is the footprint of one site, of one of the buildings, this is a footprint of another, a void in one case, and an amphitheater in another. <coughs> and the, this big gap that goes between Battery Park City and the rest of town and so on, uh, we proposed as a boulevard that would come out of, start with the site, and run all the way down to Battery Park itself which would get remodeled in part. No one wanted to do our big oval anymore. But that was, that was the proposal. The proposal was a reintegration as a memorial. This is part of the memorial. You could put up all kinds of things in relationship to that as well. And just as a comparison, this is the site for uh, World Trade Center, and these are the other sites in New York that are important. This one is Grand Central Terminal. Uh, Union Square, Rockefeller Center, look at the size of that relative to that, and mm, Gramercy Park. And then what we did was, because that worked, we discovered that the 10 million square feet you had to put back in the World Trade Center could be made by putting in <coughs> Rockefeller Center <coughs> and a couple of its buildings to the side, and it equals the World Trade Center design program by remaking the city. Those, that's pretty astonishing. Uh, we did a bunch of block array studies to show there were about 12, 15 ways of doing this in the first round. 
And then our proposal, which I just showed to you more or less, was this with towers, just one reference. There, there, there are twin towers in a different place surrounding this sort of circle of walls. There are three, four, three towers implying a fourth one in here, which is missing. So they have a kind of symbolic connection as well. And there's a hotel that sits on an axis that runs into the Winter Garden. And the upper level uh, of this street, the, the adjacent streets go up above the street and out into the Winter Garden directly. So you could drive up to the Winter Garden above the highway. It wouldn't be interfered with. That you thought they'd do. They'd do that in China in a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a sense of the atmosphere. You'd get around. This is a square opposite the church on the left, and this is one of the entrances to the memorial, which is through a gate into an interior courtyard. Uh, here's the twin towers, the way they would appear between the taller buildings of Battery Park City. So those twin towers come back again into play. And they are actually operating at a skyway level, eight to 10 stories above the street would be a skyway that goes up, and the main lobby of these buildings is up in here. And both hotel and office building mixed use. And the top of this lower promenade around the memorial would allow people to walk around the memorial in the upper levels. And that little building is actually meant to be the Port Authority's headquarters, uh, which doesn't show in this thing. But in any case, the, the key to the thing was to invent this interior framework. This, now this is, you may have noticed, this is many years after Leal. But in a certain way, this is very much like Leal. It's an armature that can hold buildings outside of it and yet remain a quiet reserve space with this being one of the footprints, an outside amphitheater which has exactly the same number of seats as those who died. You can walk in that anytime you want and you can see how many people died just by feeling the size of the room. Uh, and it would be marked off like that, and there's a kind of residue of the buildings they have. And then the other one is a peaceful pool down there. Uh, okay. Boom. This is what's happened now. There's a big tower at the end of the street. Some boulevard aspects that we proposed have been implemented. But the memorial is this, this is the memorial at night. There's water coming down into this pool. And you have to almost stand on a stool to see down into it. And it lies without surrounding boundaries. It lies in a kind of milieu of urban disorder that will always be there. So it's, uh, it was a difficult thing and a hard project to kind of be involved with because the political circumstances were so different. Uh, Montreal, a master plan competition that we did, that's an iconic image of a space, uh, the building itself is kind of iconic, but that it was also bordered by other buildings. In Montreal, the, this, this is the old town of Montreal down here, old buildings. This is the new city of Montreal that climbs up the hill to McGill University. And these three were the four, were the first buildings built down there, which are here, 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 and here. So there's a new world creeping down into the attachment to the old world. And the competition was to put a CETA, what they call the CETA International, which is a uh, branch of the UN to have international conferences for everything other than the political events. They were going to do that in Montreal, where they spoke English and French, and they had an international aspect to it for them. So first thing we did is to build on the three blocks that were there and to make a space which crosses in some logical way, joining those two into a new situation and connecting the streets. So there is that space looking from here down and putting the road still comes under, but moving the ventilator shaft to be on axis so that it closes off the plus venture there. Number two, we added buildings to complete the tr triangular space. One up here, one little down here, so it closes it down a little bit. And then the, the Cité Internationale, the headquarters of the conferences, would sit here with its secretarial staff up on there, up, up this branch that goes up. 
and then associate buildings and offices that would support that to either side of it. That then becomes almost a self-satisfying autonomous piece sitting in there with the adjacent buildings. So you get both the conference center, the secretariat, possible expansion of the secretariat and other functions all working together. And this, this is pretty small relative to what urban design can do. This is pretty big space and pretty dramatic. So how to wed the, the little with the big. And this is then the third uh, system is to develop a plan for the whole rest of the network opposite the old city, carrying these roads through, connecting the ones that could be connected, taking empty lots and making spaces. This is the same size as the uh, Place Royale, what's it called now? Place de Vosges. Uh, and this is the spatial network. It almost looks like one of those diagrams I made when I first showed you the, the linked network. Every block was figured out so that uh, new FARs that were a result of it would be uh, developable by the developers in a logical way so they'd make money. The roads both went under that and over the top. So people could be dropped off ceremonially and come into the building. This is the facade, the void of the <coughs> pitch coming back. Remember, this is a long time ago. I don't know whether I designed it the same way now. Uh, there's the elevation of that multi-lane highway, the way it works. This is the old highway running through. This is the local street running through. No, this is the, yes, and that's the elevated piece. This is what they built here. Here's the two towers. Here's the two towers. Here was this built up against the old convention center. Here's the old convention center. They built this. At least it's a block. Yeah. I give them that credit. It's a block. But, and it's almost like they built a little piece of this space, isn't it? I, I like, kind of like to think they built a little piece of that space. But anyway, this is, this is, the, this is the presentation the International Conference Center makes, and that's the one ours would have made. Mm -hmm. Now, Berlin is a different story. This is a competition for the uh, world headquarters in Berlin. The government was going to move from Bonn to Berlin. And this is the project that we did for that. This is the Reichstag. This is the Spray River that runs around like this. This is uh, the Tiergarten. This is the Van, what's it, what's it called, the Vandenberg Gate, and this is Unter den Linden. It goes back up to the cultural island here. This is the site. It had been bombed out during the war. <coughs> I don't know how they saved the Reichstag, but there were, there were two memorials, one to the Russians and one to the Americans, I think, and they're sort of missing some others. And this was the fabric that was left over around. This is modern stuff. It's almost not urban. It's very strange stuff built afterwards. The streets, the streets are huge in Berlin. And this is, this is what's left of the, uh, the whole space around the, uh, whatever. Brandenburg. Yeah, Brandenburg. <laughs> so what we did is we filled all the functions in as if it were a street system, a city system, coming back in a kind of manner that's like some of the other things here. And we placed a big space in the middle of it all, and this will sound patronizing, but we filled it with trees and made it a park. So you couldn't march troops down there, <laughs> or tanks. Uh, and you, you to, so that was, and it actually makes sense, because the Green Party in Berlin at this time was very powerful and very strong. So it had, and I'm sure that that was related to it. So we made this park, and then you could see through it under the trees from various places. And then we added on the two other memorials so that that became a crossing point from the Brandenburg Gate and Unter den Linden, which we drew out here, and this road which goes down across to what is really West Berlin. We added around the edge office buildings and a connection to the railroad station that would work and new housing. We finished that all along the river so that there's a very positive space coming from the north, looking into here, and then a continuous garden that works out there. And when you're done, you look at it, and it's all blended back. It's become a civic 
urban fabric again. That's the way it looks in height. It's only about seven or eight stories, I think. This is the model. This is the space that runs through the middle. This is the Reichstag and its forecourt. This is an area for uh, the party members. What's it called? The uh, uh, parliamentarians. Uh, go, 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 go. Okay, so here's the function of the program. Uh, the dark blue stuff are members of parliament's offices. This is the members of parliament's party headquarters. Many of them, they have many party headquarters. This is the chancellor's house with her adjacent support staff and secretariat. And it looks out into the city as well as into the central space. This is the Bundesrat, which is something they have, unlike here, it's as, it's as if there's a, a you know, parliamentary office that's only for the states. So each of the former states of Germany has a embassy that is presented to the parliament, which operates across the street. And they have a certain power of rejecting these guys. This is the parliament takes place here. They have a certain power of overseeing and tradition and these are all the little embassies off the back facing onto the tear garden and a facade and a forecourt. A court to, forecourt to this, a forecourt, honor court to that, uh, a garden out the back that connects between the two of them, a, a square, or not a forecourt, but a square in an urban environment for all the MPs' offices. Then there's two other critical things. One is the arrangement of something called uh, the uh, media center, where all interviews take place in German headquarters in one place. You can't go in anybody's office. You've got to have all the media elements come together here and they have their offices there and the parliamentarians come out and they get interviewed there and they have big presentations there. So this is the press. Then this triangle between the press and <coughs> the parliament's offices is the national archives of the German government with a facade that faces down that axis a back that joins with the uh, press corps. And these are the numbers of spaces that are produced around what is a pretty tight fabric. It's a view of the archives looking over this space, and this space being a little intimate urban network that everybody walks down and walks over to your right on axis with the Bundestag, the forecourt, the interaction in the back between all these elements, the interaction of the chancellor in her office facing into the main space and at the same time forming a, a kind of symbolic reception all the way down the long axis into the north part of Berlin and off the river. So the, all these things take place. What I think is, I'm myself most excited about is that it proves that through urban design and the combination of large scale spatial controlling elements, that you can actually symbolically represent relationships that are important. I mean, in, in our own, there's the triangle of the, but you actually don't know where the Supreme Court is, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of line up there across the street. But this, this was interesting. This. We, had to, we had to delicately proceed to make a monumental place without being monumental again, like we did in Leal. Uh, and at the same time, extract from the arrangement or reveal from the arrangement the interconnections of the various parts. And it, it, it just proved that it could be done. I don't know how good it could be. It could be better, maybe. Uh, so this is a space at the back. And here's a little diagram of all the, all the interactions that you can see around there and the way it forms a single hole. And this is what was built. Now, that's the empty site. I've kind of composed. That's the empty site. And that is a, that's a building for the parliamentarians and some more of them over here, I think. And that's the chancellor's house there. The rest of the site's empty. Here it is. Here's the, here it is. There's the, there's, with well, the porch on it, there's this kind of mega building. And the chancellor sits here with her staff and support. And all of that's left open. They built a huge railway station. And the front of this is actually a soccer field out in the park. 
on axis with the right stuff. Uh, and that's what it looks like. That building it looks actually kind of neat because it's, it's kind of Luke Connish. If you've, if you've been there, yeah, it's, kind of, it's not a handsome building. But what, it, but what it misses is the environment. What it misses is the community. What it misses is the symbolism. And, and it leaves so much left over that you you just feel queasy about it. So finally, this is the urban field, and I uh, I think you can see that we sort of discovered we worked very hard on trying to figure out how these things work together. Uh, but if you look back on it, it is possible because it doesn't involve any modern or ancient or anything kind of thing to make this out of a array of blocks, which are all closed so that there's no ambiguity about running through to them, with a continuous surface that forms a space network and public spaces. Here's the main public space in lower Manhattan, just about the same size. And for sure, the buildings I showed you in, in the air are very much like that. So one, one final thing. Here's the drawing of the, the project for the Penn Central Yards in Lower Manhattan, done in the modern way, or maybe the Chinese way. Mm -hmm. Nah, I won't, I won't discredit him for that. This is, this is city planning. City planning made this plan and then bid it out to developers. They said, you've got to build, here's enough, here's enough square footage here for you to pay for all this stuff, for you to pay to roof over the yards that are underneath it. And here's the plan. There'll be three buildings on a terrace here, one building on a little block there, Two buildings that don't even connect to a, as a block here, one set that sort of do at, at a one-story building, and then this drift, this kind of modern drift of space with these oval buildings coming down and spilling out into the river. <laughs> so romantic <Yeah. laughs> and so silly because an urban design master plan is supposed to stand there as a guide for the architects to come not next, not try and be the architects. So I tried to do it a different way, using the same square footage and mostly the same operation. And you keep the same place here, space that comes out there. These are all existing with the stripes on them. This is exactly the same square footage, if not more, in here. And a cab can drive around anywhere it wants, clearly. And this would work just as well in terms of everything they wanted to achieve as that, but it takes the New York grid and runs it through as a systematic thing that relates to the west side, the east side, downtown, and whatever. It's not hard. I don't understand it, but it has an interactive urban field, a network of space, an array of blocks, volumetric spaces, parks and squares, and solid blocks that don't have any alleys or breakdowns in them. How do I do that next? Okay, so the, a quick, I did this on the train coming back from Philadelphia in, my, in, in this notebook. I could show you where it is. It's not hard to do. And then I drew it up to scale. And what happens is that you get a, a real world out there. It could be fascinating. And the towers, I didn't ever do a calculation, obviously, but it's pretty clear that you can get everything you want in there. And the, the thing is, what's interesting, I guess I listed this up here, is that these forms are all derived from New York City. This is Tudor City, exactly the same size as the space in Tudor City. This is Union Square. This is the same size as Rockefeller Center in a similar situation, allowing each of these things to come through and each of those to go through <coughs> and making specific spaces and streets and everything out of it. And this would be, to make this work, you have to build the block. So the, this is a view of the eight to 10 story urban base with streets and blocks and mixed use, et cetera that would allow the art stars to build their towers. These, the towers I built on here, more or less, are the same ones as in the original plan. There's a Bob Stern twin job here. <laughs> There's somebody else here. There's a KPF building here, which they're making into three. So I, 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 this is amazing, because we've just given up on urbanism. This is, uh, just to end, if, you, if, you, if you're gonna live in the city, in the future, we all have to learn how to make them again, I think, or be insistent that they should be made. Maybe that's a better way to put it. I think we kind of know how to make them now. Uh, this is my apartment in Rome when I was teaching at Notre Dame, and this is my notebook. 
that I thought about this stuff when I was actually in Rome. And I, I believe that, that one of, if it's not clear, I believe that all these things about cities are not statistical, are not economic, are not numbers, they're not sociology, they're form. So you should be able to do anything at any scale by drawing it. You should be able to draw a city or parts of a city or think about design through drawing. I think that's it. My, my partner, Barbara Littenberg, offers her apologies for not coming, but she had something else to do. So I I'll did her presentation as well. And she asked me, before you two guys leave, you have to answer this question. She asked me to ask, how many of you students, if there's any left, uh, <laughs> want as a goal to go live in a dense, urban, central city? They don't, oh, one of them does, one doesn't. <laughs> and how many of you could see that as a future place to live all your lives. Not quite the same, is it? Well, it's really hard. Yeah, I mean, I, she, she asked if that's a trick question, obviously. Because I, I know you might, but there's also the tendency in American culture to move out once you get things going. Yeah. And get to, get to that ideal American dream, which isn't city at all. City is not our dream. Uh, but it could be. Are there anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for this presentation. And I, I thought the drawings are really exquisite and it's so convincing. And so I'm, I'm asking a question really about the discrepancy, about this really wonderful, clear, beautifully presented proposals, and then the kind of mess they really build. So why did this reality? <laughs> well, that's the flaw in your Why did you build it? Or why did you fail? <laughs> I say the same thing to myself. <laughs> After I retire, I say, oh, that's fine. I, I don't know. It takes, it, first of all, the project in New York, for instance, to get that built took almost 15 years. Mm -hmm. There's not enough money in the world to hire us to work on it for 15 years. And even if they'd hired us to do the architecture, we weren't big enough a firm. There's, a, there's an explanation every time, but it mostly is lack of will on the part of the people in charge to make something good happen and to stretch it, to stretch it just a little bit, you know. It's like these guys built those slabs in the back of those blocks and they didn't connect them and they ignored the interior entirely. But the World Trade Center, it's, there was so much energy, there was so much money, there was so much kind of right. and idealism and then they kind of went for the worst compromise. What is the truth of the The reason for that is quite simple. Governor Pataki wanted to run for president. He wanted to run for president, and Danny Liebeskin had done a project in Israel for the cosmetic company. What's the name of that? It doesn't matter. A very strong Israeli supporter in America who gives lots of money to Republicans. And Danny was Jewish, and I'm not saying, I, my wife's Jewish too, so there's no prejudice involved here. Uh, <laughs> there was a connection. He figured if he got Israel to like this, if it could be seen as a memorial to this initially sad thing, that he would show strength. But it wasn't, he, he made the decision on his own. Outside the committees, outside the, so what do you do? Uh, and we were undercover. In that case, I am so pleased and proud to be involved in designing it, but we were working behind the scenes for almost a year showing them all these early projects, showing the committee what they could do, what they should try and avoid. And then when the, they hired the other guys, they had to let on that we were there. I'll never forget presenting our work to Bayer, Blinder, and Bell, who were hired to do the master plan, finally in public. And John Bell looked at me and said, Stephen, how long have you been here? Because <laughs> we'd been working on it for a year, and no one knew about it. So, that was another problem. That's not why they, that's, in the essence, they couldn't pick us anyway. It would have looked like total collusion, and certainly the governor would never have had, had the creds to run for president. He didn't anyway, as it turns out. <laughs>
But this, yeah. So how do we get um, then uh, uh, the uh, SOM after all that? Oh, because they were the clients. SOM was Larry Silverstein's architect. It had nothing to, you're right, that's a very good question. Because the whole planning process was to come up with something, guidelines that they had to follow. Which, given Liebeskind's plan, they sort of, sort of they're going to build the same volumes. They're going to arrange the site the same way, nothing like we did. But who, after all said and done, uh, Silverstein owned all the property. You know, I got my architects here. Mm -hmm. Come on in, do this and do what you want. And that was, I mean, that's Skidmore for you. I mean, I worked for Skidmore in Chicago, so I know. They're very adept, they're very skilled, uh, they're very clever at manipulating and getting work. I, mean, I don't even mean that in a bad way. They're, they're amazing somehow. So that's the way, that's way SOM came in. They were always there. Yeah. I'll never forget at the beginning of the process, uh, there's a woman there who's a partner who does planning. I can't think of her name. Uh, said in a meeting like this when we were all agonizing over what we we're going to do for the city and what was going to happen and how we we're going to do she said i have to say that in the end who has the client wins <laughs> and we all kind of <laughs> bowed <laughs> our heads <laughs> all right well thank you very much for coming i appreciate it